like copies or something. Oh, I know. Oh, great. So I get them all blown up. Do I have to do anything particular on any of these? Just cut off this part of me, Teresa. There are people than I thought here. You guys got the opener? Oh, so what are you doing now, Joe? I'm uh, an advisor to a reserve unit that's in Philadelphia. Uh, the second brigade, uh, 157. What kind of rank are you now? Co-colonel. Great. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good, well, Hi, Fred. Good to be here. Yeah. Well, I know yeah. you have a chance. There's some beautiful hotel built up. In, in fact, just a brand new, beautiful. It was. And how about uh, in your living room? He died. He died. Oh, yeah. Someone in place. very kind of about it. I'll tell you what you need. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, this is General Kennard. I wanted to make sure that you had General Kennard, Division Commander, for Colonel Bauer in San Antonio. Hey, General Kennard. How are you? And uh, then I'll work with you all the way. Are you okay?
Republic of Vietnam during the period 23 October 1965 to 26 November 1965. Following the attack on a special forces camp at Playme in Pleiku province on 19 October 1965 by regular units of the Army of North Vietnam, the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile was committed to action. The division was initially assigned the mission of protecting the key communication center of Pleiku, in addition to providing fire support both for the Army of the Republic of Vietnam armored column dispatched to the relief of the besieged camp and for the camp itself. The 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, having recently been organized under a completely new concept in tactical mobility and having arrived in the Republic of Vietnam only a month earlier, responded quickly with an infantry brigade and supporting forces. Using air assault techniques, the division deployed artillery batteries into firing positions deep within the enemy Heron territory and provided the vital fire support needed by the Arvin forces to accomplish the relief of the Special Forces camp. By 27 October, the tactical and strategic impact of the presence of a North Vietnamese regular army division in Pleiku province necessitated a change in missions for the 1st Cavalry Division. The division was given an unlimited offensive role to seek out and destroy the enemy force. With bold thrusts, elements of the division pursued the North Vietnamese regiments across the dense and trackless jungles of the West Central Highlands, seeking the enemy out in his previously secure <coughs> sanctuaries and giving him no quarter. In unfavorable terrain and under logistical and tactical conditions that would have stopped a unit with less capability, motivation, and esprit, the cavalrymen repeatedly and decisively defeated numerically superior enemy forces. The superb training, unflinching devotion to duty, an unsurpassed gallantry and intrepidity of the cavalrymen individually and collectively resulted in numerous victories and succeeded in driving the invading North Vietnamese division back from its positions at Lame to the foot of Chupong Massif. There in the Valley of the Adrang, the enemy was reinforced by a fresh regiment and undertook preparations for more incursions into Pleiku province. The 1st Cavalry Division deployed by air its men and weapons to launch an attack on this enemy staging area which was 35 kilometers from the nearest road and 50 kilometers from the nearest logistical base. Fully utilizing air mobility and applying their combat power in a series of offensive blows, the men of the division completely defeated the numerically superior enemy. When the enemy finally withdrew his broken forces from the battlefield, the offensive capability of the North Vietnamese Army in the two core tactical zone had been blunted. The outstanding performance and extraordinary heroism of the members of the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile and attached units under the most hazardous and adverse conditions reflect great credit upon themselves, the United States Army, and the armed forces of the United States. And when that was read in the Rose Garden in 1968, President Johnson hung the presidential unit citation <coughs> on the colors of the 1st Cavalry Division. We'd now like to recognize all of the units that are authorized to <laughs> headquarters and headquarters company, first brigade.
year at the Ford Hood reunion, I talked with uh, a couple of men from the 3rd Brigade. Ron Sleas, right here. I might get you stand a minute, Ron. Rifleman, Bill Crasher, and Ron was a combo man in the 3rd uh, Brigade headquarters uh, during the Adran campaigns, play crew campaign, and later when I was a brigade commander. These two guys said to me, we're going to put on an LZ X-ray Albany Adran reunion. What do you think? I said, if there's anybody can do it, two outstanding enlisted men turned loose, <laughs> not bothered, and get the job done. Now, these guys, over the, the ensuing year, have made numerous phone calls to me, to others of you, to others not here, have made trips down here, have met in other parts of the country. They have rented a hospitality room here in this resort, bought all the booze, all at their own expense. Not one time have these guys asked for a nickel. And they don't intend to. And I think these, these two troopers are super. team share a kinship of special respect and love. We are, in fact, a band of brothers. There's an even more special chemistry which tightly bonds together for time and eternity. Those soldiers who have stood shoulder to shoulder, outnumbered, in a savage, furious battle, and held their ground against awesome odds and under extremely difficult circumstances, and police the battlefield, and picked up the enemy weapons and walked across the enemy dead. So it was at Bastogne. World War II, General Kennard was there. So it was at Chip Yong Ni in the Korean War. General Paul Freeman, at that time Colonel Commanding 23rd Infantry Regiment, and God rest his soul. And in the Idrang Valley of Vietnam in November 1965. Band of brothers stood tall. How can even well trained men possibly win when faced with seemingly insurmountable odds? It's sure as hell not easy, but it can be done. How? Well, you need several things. I'll only list six. And number one in my books is a winning spirit firmly stabilized and unshakable in the head of every man. Never quit. Three strikes and you're not out. Drive on. Second, layers and layers and layers of personal and unit and weapons discipline. Third, truly outstanding non-commissioned officers at every level, and 
Here I want to be specific and tie this point down very tight to the first calf. In the play coup campaign and in the eye drain, when we deployed to Nam, the calf line units were composed mainly of battalions which came from the 2nd Infantry Division. Not so for the Aviation Brigade units. Now listen to this. The non-commissioned officers of those battalions had served in those infantry and artillery units for as many as three to six years. Same units. Most had fought in Korea. Many in World War II. My command sergeant major, Basil Plumley, was one of the few surviving four jump bastards of the 82nd Airborne. Sicily, Italy, Normandy, and Holland. These men from Krypton were the real strength and the vital strength of that division. Fourth, you combine top line NCOs with solid troopers in the ranks many of whom had gone through basic AIT and months of tough field training together, and you have unit cohesion. A family of fighters who know that the men on their right and left are not going to drop back. The fifth ingredient, you have to have superb leadership from the division commander. We all know the old saying in the military that the personality of the leader determines the personality of the unit. And so it was in the CAV, 65. In our case, John Kennard constantly drummed into his officers' heads that the authority to make decisions, big decisions, heavy duty decisions, important decisions, had to be broken down the chain of command to the lowest possible <laughs> commissioned and non-commissioned levels, and even lower, if there weren't any NCOs around. And this is what General Kennard called the paratrooper philosophy, the airborne outlook after a combat jump. Units and men are scattered all around, and they've got to be effective. Air assault operations likewise. And the final ingredient is unit heritage a conviction on the part of every man never to bring disgrace on the colors under which he serves or to the great soldiers of the past who served under those colors. You combine these six ingredients, a winning never quit attitude, individual unit and weapons discipline, superb non-commissioned officers, unit cohesion in the ranks, division commander who demands decentralization of authority and decision making, undying unit heritage, and what do you have? I'll tell you what you have. You got the best trained, best disciplined, most professional, toughest fighting division team that the U.S. Army had since the famous airborne divisions of World War II. And what else were we? Band of brothers. And who were we who fought in that faraway field, in that remote corner of Asia, in that week in November of 65? Mostly infantry, but also we had engineer demo men, medics, tube artillery, as we call it, and their FOs, rocket artillery, or as we call it, ARA. Scouts from the CAV squadron, Air Force FAC teams on the ground, Pathfinder teams on the ground, Air Force fighter bombers were part of that team, air crews of the Aviation Brigade, and above all others in that category, the men of A Company 229th lift ships, the Slicks, who took us in and brought us in ammo and water under fire time after time, and took out our wounded and our dead. <clears throat> and I am very
greatly honored today to see Colonel Paul Winkle retired. Orange one, served under snake shit six, <laughs> A Company 229, and he made it just, he got to the airport about a half hour before he was supposed to eat. And he's going back, I think, this afternoon, he says, this is the best $400 lunch he ever had. Santa Paul. <laughs> and we're sure as hell not out. Never quit, never stop fighting, make the other guy stop and fall back. Never say no to yourself, make the other guy say no. No matter what the odds, and if you believe it, you can do it. I wasn't in the battle at LZ Albany, but later I commanded the men who survived and I grew to know them well in many hard battles when I commanded the 3rd Brigade across the highlands from the South China Sea to the borders of Laos and Cambodia. And I have the highest respect for the officers and the men down in the ranks who fought at Albany and in many other tough battles. And I must make special mention here Major Frank Henry, executive officer of 2nd and 7th Cav, a rock of a man, who held the line at LZ Albany and in the cemetery, in the grime and the sand and the damp and the cold of LZ 4 on the Bong San Plain. And I want to make mention of Captain Myron D. Dork. In my view, the finest company commander, battlefield company commander I have ever known, and that includes myself, and I commanded a rifle company in the Korean War. Steve Dirk had it all over me. I thought that was pretty goddamn hot. Steve <laughs> <laughs> Dirk, killed in action on his second tour, were extraordinarily D. Durick and Frank Henry were extraordinarily gifted leaders. And they're with us today. <clears throat> At X-Ray, early on in that fight, it became crystal clear to me that that North Vietnamese commander was desperately determined to kill or capture all of my battalion. Of course, I didn't have my battalion on the ground. It took five and a half hours to get it down with a 40-minute round trip of 16 birds, not counting refueling. But I was more, more determined than he was that this wouldn't happen. And I can honestly tell you that not once in those three days did a doubt cross my mind that we would go down. I'll tell you, I was struck by the fury and the strength and the aggressiveness and the continuing non-stop intensity of his efforts to overrun us. I must confess that one time early in the battle, I fleetingly perceived the similarity between our situation, less than 450 of us taking on 3,000 or more with the 7th Cav at the Little Bighorn in that valley of Montana in June of 1875. <clears throat> but we were determined there'd be no replay of Custer's last stand in, in that valley of the Idrain. But in the final analysis, it always comes down to the men up front who have to lay their lives on the line, the junior officers, the lieutenants, Sometimes a captain has to get into it, 
the officers who are not commissioned, the NCOs, and ultimately those glorious troopers in the ranks who have no option. They got to do what they're told. Band of brothers. I've often thought in wonderment, where do we get such men as you? What is it that inspires a platoon medic to rise from cover in a firestorm of bullets to treat a wounded comrade? What is it that energizes a trooper in a pinned down unit to struggle up under fire and take on single-handed a reinforced machine gun nest and kill them all? What is it that compels a Huey crew to want to keep flying into a hot LZ time after time to bring in ammo and water to grunts on the ground and take out our wounded? And what is it that motivates a trooper to make a split-second decision to fall on a live hand grenade to protect his fellow soldiers? Where do we get men such as these? in this country, men such as you. Now let me say something else. In this room today are veterans of the savagery of the Idrang. Also here are veterans of other battles in Vietnam over the 11 years of U.S. involvement there. Also in this room today are veterans of Korea and World War II. We're all a band of brothers. But since this gathering today is affording special recognition to those men from across the cab who fought in the Idrang and who supported us there, there is indeed a tangible, living, additional presence among us. And that pervasive presence are the souls and the fighting spirit of the men who died on that field or having survived were killed on other battlegrounds in Vietnam on their second, third, fourth, or more tours of duty, or who died in later life. To all those men, we say we remember you well, we remember you frequently, our old foxhole buddies, who were with us in those early electric days 11th Air Assault, 1st Cav. And I, for one, take comfort in my firm belief that I will see you again. And you know what those guys would say to us now if only we could hear? Have a hell of a good reunion. Gary on, sir. We are forever in time and eternity a band of brothers. Thank you. Gary on.
idea that I was going to be the recipient of it, but I'm deeply honored to receive it, and I do that do it with great humility, because I knew from the first day of the first man coming into the 11th Air Assault until I left the division, that I was particularly blessed to have the opportunity to serve with men such as you. And I, I'm only grateful that the Lord has seen fit to let me stick around long enough to see you repeatedly and to be with this band of brothers which Al Moore so eloquently described. Thank you very much. I've been asked to, to uh, make a presentation <coughs> to Al Moore. And, uh, Most of us go through life and don't meet anyone who has a uh, sort of a deep and abiding influence on your life. I remember when I first met Colonel Moore, I reported to the, to the, uh, what was then, the, just become the first cab, August of 65. And uh, there was a big gymnasium where we were all signing in. That was you know, one of the last folks to ride, I guess. I, I'd been orders to Korea, and I kept calling Department of the Army is telling them I, I, uh, I want to go back to Vietnam. I've been there already with the Special Forces Academy. And they said, no, you're going to Korea. And I ship all my stuff to Korea. And, uh, but I came back and called them again. And finally, I, I was on, on leave after finishing the uh, career course. And I got a phone call. And they said, uh, we want you to report to Fort Benning three days. And I said, I don't want to go to Fort Benning. I want to go to Vietnam. And the, the officer at the other end of the phone uh, said, shut up and go to Fort Benning. <laughs> and uh, so I got, I got to Fort Benning, and I was a long line of folks, and I uh, show up in this gym, and I, they asked me, well, Captain, what do you want to do? I said, I want to commit a rifle company. And uh guy goes down to the roster and says, uh, there aren't any rifle companies open anymore. He said, we'll, we'll make this the commo officer in the uh, first brigade. I said, no, mm, I don't want that. And he said, well, uh, that's the job we're going to assign you. So I said, okay. I left, and I went down, uh, started knocking on brigade commander's doors. And I finally ended up in uh, Colonel Tim Brown's door. And he said, well, we don't have any uh, uh, companies open the brigade, but Colonel Hal Moore has a uh, job down there in his battalion staff, so you can go down there and see if he'll take you. So I went down and reported in to uh, Colonel Moore. And uh, so that day, he has been a, uh, you know, a person that has a, a really profound influence on me and on many of us in this room. The uh, I consider myself fortunate to have met him, to have worked for him. 
the, uh, I think in, in his talk, which is obviously you know, hard to follow up on, there's one thing that he didn't mention, and that is that the, uh, he, or actually he did mention, the, the, he talked about the General Canard said he planned for the division, well, he certainly said he planned it for the first and seventh. And the, uh, his tenacity, if there's, if there's one thing that I think kept us alive, it was his ability to transmit to all of us the fact that we were not going to quit, that we were not going to be allowed to quit, that the, uh, you know, we were the first seventh calf, and by God, we were going to do it right. The, uh, he transmitted a value to all of us that was essential in the success of that fight. So, not only for that, but for just knowing you for many years thereafter, uh, I was asked to present to you the guide on of the first of seven. you men who signed this guide on. It will be treasured by me and my family down through the centuries. Let me tell you an anecdote about Tony. I was in my CP at you know, Kelly Hill at Fort, where, where, where was Fort Benning. <laughs> Kelly Hill at Fort Benning, one afternoon in summer of 65, it was hot as hell, like always. And a Sergeant Major, Plumley, came in and said, Sar, there's a captain out here who wants to see you. <laughs> What's his name? Captain ne ne Needle or no Noodle or something like that. Sent him in. Tony walked in, saluted smartly. He got right to the point. Tony is a very candid, honest, aggressive, cocky individual. Before he opened his mouth, over 10 seconds, I knew I liked the man because I love that type of man. <laughs> I was raised in the paratroops by paratroopers, such as General Kennard, General Joe Swing. I was in the 82nd right after General you know, Gavin left it, and his personality was so pervasive it was still around for months. And I love a cocky soldier. A cocky soldier with good leadership will do anything. And so Tony said, sir, I like command company in your battalion. Well, Tony had done his homework. He knew I had a first lieutenant command to come in. The uh, previous company commander, Captain Bud Everhart, having inexplicably uh, resigned his commission. And I said, well, Tony, uh, I don't know anything about you. I admire you for taking leave from <laughs> Fort Sill at the time, Tony, somewhere, Fort Knox. He took leave to come and find a job as a rifle company commander to go fight. Oh, that's pretty good. So. I said, Tony, I'll take you on, but you're going to have to be the battalion S2 for a while. And uh, we'll see what the company opens up, see how you perform, you'll probably get it if you do good. And so we went on to Vietnam, and uh, I, have a, I had a strong policy in the two wars I fought in that not one man would be left missing in action on the battlefield. And in two wars, I brought back all my MIA. The thing I'm most proud of is that. We brought every man back that went into the fight. And uh, I had a, this lieutenant out on a company patrol mission one day in early October. He had a man missing. 
couldn't, couldn't account for him for several hours. Well, that opened up a company for Tony. <laughs> Pretty quick. Of course, the man went to sleep, and they didn't check the numbers right when they moved out, having taken a break on the patrol. Well, I didn't like that. So Tony got the company, and he had the company, a company, for only about two weeks before in the LZ X-ray. And I don't know how Tony's alive today, because in one spot in that fight, his artillery F.O. Lieutenant Tim Blake on his right was was shot dead by machine gun fire. Sergeant Jell, his commo, star, commo sergeant and RTO on his left was killed with the same burst. And the FO's RTO was killed on the same burst and Tony wasn't smashed. Thank God. Tony, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. What we're proud to present is from Company A, to our commanding officer, Tony Nadal. by the indomitable team of Bill Kreischer and Ron Slias. <laughs> On the front of the jacket, read it out, Tony. He was, he was your officer. Joe Marm, that's his colonel, A Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Cav, Gary Overgate. came down uh, from, from Philadelphia to be uh, among uh, my soldiers and, uh, and fellow first cab men. So it's quite an honor for me to, to be here with you, and I, I hope to meet each and every one of you. Uh, I had great leadership, too, all the way down, and the men under me were just super. I couldn't have asked for a better, a better unit. I was uh, fresh out of uh, ranger school, uh, fresh out of OCS, supposed to go to Fort Jackson to push basic trainees when we got the word at, uh, down the at uh, Eglin Air Force Base that they needed some uh, lieutenants in the, uh, and the rumor was that they were going to Vietnam, but it wasn't official yet. So uh, uh, the same thing happened to me. You know, it, uh, everybody wanted to get an airborne units, uh, and I wound up going to uh, the 7th Cav. And uh, I remember my first <coughs> baptism of fire with the, uh, out there in Kelly Hill. One of the soldiers saluted very smartly, and, and he said, uh, Gary on. I didn't hear him right. I thought he said, carry on. <laughs> but uh, we had the tra tradition of saluting and saying, carry on. And that's uh, very, that was my first uh, introduction. We had a very crusty first sergeant and, and, uh, who uh, led us and showed all the tents the ropes. But uh, my unit, my platoon had been together through all the air assault testing uh, for two years. I couldn't have asked for a better unit of 40, 42, uh, 42 soldiers, from the uh, the sergeants all the way down to the uh, the the, uh, base, the the troops were just an outstanding group. And I thought as I went over on the USS Maurice Rose, boy, if one of them gets wounded or uh, or shot, you know, what am I going to do? But uh, we we just filled the ranks and we did an outstanding job <coughs> all the way up and down the line. Just an outstanding bunch of, uh, of soldiers. And uh, I saw that. When I went back in 69, we didn't have that same, uh, that same experience. And uh, but boy, in 65, I was very fortunate to have that, uh, that dedicated uh, group of brothers to fight with and to lead. It was my honor to, to, to have led you. Thank you very much. Company Sucker of the Seventh. And uh, at this time, I'd like you to, uh, to meet John Settler. speaking and it's hard to follow an act like this. 
About a year ago, uh, we got deciding, and Bill Kirshner pulls me out in a parade in Washington, D.C., and blisters my feet on a five mile march, and got me involved once again with the first calf. And at that time, I started recollecting about all the people I had served with and served under, and all the men that was with me during I drank and LZ X ray in Albany and the ones at the graveyard. And uh, I didn't know how to say thanks. And I didn't know how to give something to an individual that I didn't serve directly with except for a few days, but made an impact on my life and probably will for the rest of my life. And none of you except a few have seen this. And at this time, I'd like to bring General Howell Moore up, please. I'd like to press, present him with United States Army SOG number 72, it's a collector's item. And there's a, there's an inscription on the back I'd like for General Moore to read. Take me by a total surprise here. It says, presented to General Halmore from the survivors of Idrang Valley. The next word. The 7th Cavalry Regiment. 7th Cavalry Regiment. 1st Cavalry Division, First November 1965. November 1st and 2nd of 7th KL. And I thank you all more than I can ever describe. And this will be a treasure also, along with the guy on. Now, we've had a lot of people honored up here. And uh, I only fought in LZ X-ray. But I want every man with me in LZ X-ray. I'm going to start at this table, work over here, to get up and state his name, 